This is an eight iron and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Take that shank. Hop off the path. Oh. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite and it's in. Kind of like that. Well, I would like to welcome PGA Tour winner, Champions Tour winner uh, this season, uh, Harrison Frazier to the Sub-70 Podcast. Harrison, uh, thanks for the time. I've uh, been looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you for having me, and uh, I appreciate you guys' patience. And um, I'm glad, glad to spend an hour with you. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, it, it's been a while since 2011 to 2023 with the win at the at the Dominion, so... What's it like standing over? I was watching it live. Was that about an eight footer, nine footer for the win? <laughs> yeah, about yeah, probably ten. You know, t- ten feet in in that area. Maybe you know, it felt a little longer, but especially when I was waiting for it to roll in, it felt like it took forever. Uh, so it could have been eighteen feet for all I knew. But uh, yeah, I would say ten feet. Uh, how, how was it? Like it, you're back in the battlefield. You've been playing well. I was, I was looking at the stats. Like you were trending up to it. How did how did it yeah. feel to be back in that position after all these years, with a chance to sort of get to the top of mountain again? Well, you know, I, uh, the year before at Furyk event at the Constellation, I I got myself in the hunt again for the first time in a long time, and but that was kind of one of those things Sunday where I just had a great round and was five or six holes in front of, in front of Stricker and those guys, and so while I was on the verge of having a good tournament, I, I wasn't feeling the heat all day. This was, and then I got into contention again at Akron and I played in the leader group for three straight days. Uh, so I got a good taste of it there. And then I got close again in Flint um, this year, played in the leader group the last two days. So uh, it had, it had been building and I was remarkably very comfortable um, uh, get, getting, getting back in there and, remember being very um very at peace uh with everything going on my mind wasn't racing my body wasn't racing too much i was very observant so uh it it felt it felt amazing it was a uh, it's been a long like you said it's been uh, 12 years so you know and it's one of those things that when you get in the hunt if you believe in what you're doing it's uh it, it's it's not overwhelming at the time it's it's overwhelming before you tee off and it's overwhelming after but in the act of it it's not too bad was there a freedom on that round where you were five holes ahead six holes ahead six holes ahead where you know you're back out there you can kind of freewheel it that's got to be a different pressure than you were on that lead that whole tournament when you won this year at dominion right so is there a little bit of a uh, different mindset different what am i trying to say like you've been in so many situations before but is there uh (laughs) does being on the lead after for three days straight way on you different than it is where it's like I'm on fire and I'm just going to roll with this on Sunday. No, not really. I, I think, uh, well, it is, it's not more, it's just different types of pressure. So in the situation a year ago in, uh, in Jacksonville, I, I caught fire and was watching myself go up the leaderboard. I needed a good, I needed a good week to, you know, try to try to improve my status because I had very little status after taking off seven or eight years prior and so I needed it, you know, but I knew I kind of had it and I was just rolling with it and, and kind of trying to see what, where it could take me during that day. Uh, it was a little bit more of an amp, um, you know, in a, in a finite period of time. Whereas when you're playing well, you know, you kind of up at the beginning and then you kind of have to just plateau and you got stuff, good things are around you, you know, happening and you're in a good spot, but you've had a couple of days to, you know, kind of settle into the process. So it still means a bunch, but it's just things that when, when you're, when you're leading for three days, you're, you're, you're just, you're, you're moving a little slower. You're not, you're not quite as amped up about the moment. What did that, you know, when it's over and the press is over and you're holding the trophy and you're there, uh, I know, you know, you don't do this by yourself. There's family behind you. Your wife's behind you. Your parents are behind you. Um, what did it mean to the the Fraser family of and it's it's a team effort. I know this from talking to a bunch of the other guys, you know, from from being yeah. out there. And what did that what did it mean to you to to win again? 
Well, it, it, it is a team effort. Golf is an interesting thing. You know, we're all a little bit weird in, in what we do because the, the there are different levels of, of success, but winning doesn't happen very often unless you're somebody like a, you know, Stricker or a Tiger. You know, it, it it's something that, that is, uh, it's very, it's very emotional. Uh, there, there's a huge sense of relief and accomplishment, you know, and I've said this before and people think I'm nuts. You, you have, you have people supporting you and they're behind you. They, they do feel the ups and downs with you, but when you're a golfer, you, you know, all those people pulling for you, if you mess it up, you messed it up. You can't blame it on a coach. You can't blame it on your offensive lineman. You can't blame it on, you know, a ref. <laughs> you can't blame it on anybody else. You're out there in front of of everybody. Uh, not only your 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 people on TV, but the crowd and and your and your peers and your caddy. You got a lot of people. So the flip side of that is when you do succeed, the the feeling is absolutely uh, one of um, joy. It's just joy. You, you, you did it right. And, uh, and it's, and it's almost indescribable what that, what that feeling is. You got so many people that are, that are trying to beat you and, and champions tour golf is different than the big tour, but you got less people trying to beat you, but, uh, you still, you know, you're, you're overcoming your, your own odds and your own demons and the conditions and the course and others, and, and you do it. And, and so I think my family, you know, they were, they were committed to this plan that we put in place nine years ago and, you know, they never wavered. Uh, but in the ups and downs, I certainly did. And they, they, they kept me going. The people around me kept me going, but gosh, I mean, when that final putt goes in, you want to be respectful of everything. You want to make sure you're, you find your opponent and shake his hand, but gosh, you really just want to lay down on the green and just do do snow angels and because uh, because you're just so happy so but it means a lot it means the world uh, a lot of people i think were, were were in this fight with me and they were all sharing the same pride yeah i uh you know i've been a fan of yours for a long time it was it's 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 all you know and i would say like you know first yeah i'm a fan of yours probably not supposed to admit that for guys on the podcast that's, but that's i love okay. golf and and uh it's always good to see any kind of guy that, you know, I love golf of, of winning again after that, um, that, that time off, right? Cause it's hard. It's hard in, you know, the, the, the work that it takes. So it's, if it was you or anybody else who haven't won for that period of time, it's cool to watch, right? It's cool to yeah. see. It's cool to, you know, to know how much, cause I'm friendly with a lot of the guys on the, you know, on the, on the champions tour and regular tour. And I know how hard you guys work. You know, everyone thinks Champions Tour is wine and dinners and, you know, 10 minutes of putting. Uh, not, not the case, <laughs> right? Go out there on yeah, a Tuesday no. and watch how many hours you guys are putting in. Um, it's competitive, right? And the quality of golf is still really, really, really good. Um, you, you know, the other thing I was going to ask you is I know you took that time off. And I know you kind of had those moments in your 40s. And I'm just I'm paraphrasing, but from reading the article and stuff, of was the motivation gone a little bit? You know, you won – you're in your forties, still have a family at home. Like, what am I doing out here by myself? You know, and then I know you were working, you know, in the business world for a while. Like what made you right. want to put the work and effort? Cause you know, we always knew you had the talent, but it's still talent alone out there is not enough to do it. Everybody out there has talent, like to get sure. yourself ready to do this and get out there and win again. Like what, what sparked that? Like I'm willing to do the work to do oh. Gosh, it's funny. You know, I, um, so I, I would, I would say I had a, um, you know, slightly better than average tour career up, you know, up until my early forties. And, and I got really, really close to winning early, um, and felt like I should have won many more. It just didn't happen for whatever reasons. And then I put winning on a pedestal and made it into being more than it really is and more than it should be, uh, which, you know, created, you know, this kind of a, a, a little bit of a, a buffer around it, if you want to call it that. And then I finally felt like I cracked the, the eggshell and I started having a whole bunch of issues with back, shoulder, knees, hips. I needed a hip replacement. Uh, you know, people were telling me I needed back surgery. People were telling me I needed to have ribs removed. I mean, there were, there was so much going on and I tried to play hurt for so long and it just got to the point where I just was spending more time on a, on a physio table 
every week than I was actually practicing on my game. And it just got to the point where it wasn't worth it. It wasn't good for me mentally. It wasn't good for my family. It wasn't good for anybody. So I made the decision to walk away. And, you know, for the first couple of years, I would try to get back and I'd go back to doing the same stuff and injuries would, you know, come right back. And uh, so I went to work. I had a new perspective really on life where, and I was running a, actually running a youth uh, lacrosse league um, and was seeing kids, you know, play sports for the love of it. And I was spending all my time in a volunteer capacity. So I, I, I went to work and uh, COVID came and COVID, I couldn't go to the office. I couldn't go to bars and happy hours, cocktail hour. I couldn't go to lunches. I couldn't go to breakfast. I couldn't go do business development stuff. I couldn't go to the range. You know, we, the only thing I could do was take a small bag and put a few clubs in the bag and we would go walk, carry our own bag and play golf. And, and we've got about at Trinity Forest, we've got about probably 40 guys who are all two handicaps or better. And we played golf every day. And I started to realize that I missed it and that I loved it still. And, you know, the thrill of hitting a good shot when it matters, whether it's for five bucks or for, you know, a couple hundred thousand, it doesn't really change when you care about what you're doing. And I, and I found out and I remembered that I loved it. So that was, uh, that was really the moment. I always kind of had this idea, but that was the moment, the, the first months or so of COVID was when I realized, okay, I'm going to really make a run at this. And I, I feel like I got cheated a little bit. I felt like I had something left to prove um, from the way the, the regular tour career ended. And I wanted to be different than that. I didn't like the way it sat with me. So that's when I decided we're going to go, we're going to go at this. What did you do from a, I mean, you know, my body started falling apart from golf. I'm 50 in my forties. I mean, it's, you know, I've had a full knee replacement. Trust me. I get it. Like my body is saying uncle at some point doing everything we can, but like injuries, you know, hard as you guys swing for that long, it leads up to it. So how are you, adapting to it now because some of those things don't what they, maybe we manage them but they don't fully go away right right so yeah, how are no, you they, sort of they, dealing with yeah. that in your 50s playing a bunch of golf and playing three programs a week when you're out there and how are you managing <laughs> that at this point so it doesn't get to the point where you're you know back more on the table than you are on the on the practice range well basically it's just being a little bit smarter about how you do what you do and uh, I had to change the way I do things and I had to give up some old things. So meaning I was always a power player. I always, you know, my swing speed was always at one, anywhere from one fifteen to one eighteen. Um, and I hit a fade everywhere I went. And the only way you can do that with that kind of swing speed is to stay in posture and hinged yeah. um, all the way through. Well, that puts a, an, a, an exorbitant amount of stress on, on your back and your hips. And, so I had I kept trying to go back to that, going back to that, and I started to realize that that was the problem. It wasn't necessarily golf; it was how I was doing it. So um, I still hit it a long way. I still I still move it just fine, but I allow myself to stand up more. I'm not I'm not forcing it into the posture position. And and one of the benefits of the Champions Tour is everybody out there is hurt. And you talk about pro ams. You know, nobody's out there. Our coaches and our teachers aren't out there monitoring everything you do every day. And if you're hurt a little bit, you just laugh it off. You know, have have some decent BS with your with your playing partners and tell them, yeah, I'm not feeling great today. And you try to get to know them more instead of worrying about your game and, and save yourself um, some of the physical strain. And when I'm at home, uh, I play golf a couple of times a week and I hit balls a few times a week, but I save most of my prep for the week of the tournament for learning the golf course, for chipping and putting, for figuring out strategies instead of trying to hit the perfect golf shot and, and just doing it so much. So I bet in my PGA tour career, I probably would, um, you know, it would be nothing for me to hit balls five times a, a week and hit, you know, 300 a day. Now I'm probably hitting 300 a week in practice. So, yeah. you know, that's just a lot less load and a lot less stress. And and the simple truth is, if you're starting to your your body gets hurt, your body hurts when it's trying to tell you don't do that. So, you know, if if it hurts to do that, stop doing it for a little while. 
and and take care of it, stretch, ice, you know, just just be smart. Are you still playing the power fade most of the time? Uh, I do with the driver, um, just because I've never been comfortable seeing the ball go right to left with the driver. But no, I mean, everything else is now got a little, it's a little lower ball flight. Uh, it's got a little bit more right to left. It's, um, you know, most of the time it's, it's, it's a straight ball, really. Um, in fact, it's hard for me to now hit a hard hold with a, with a mid iron or a short iron, just because I can't stay down there. And, yeah. and I'm just not going to try to do that anymore. It's okay. You know, um, uh, there's a lot of guys that have made a, a really nice living out there hitting a nice little flat draw. Yeah, and I was still look, I was looking at your stats. I mean, obviously your driver is still a weapon. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's long and it's straight, right? And you're going to have, as far as you're hitting it, you know, if you work on that 100 yards and inks, you're going to have a lot of short irons in on the Champions Tour, you know, with the distance you're hitting it out there. So, you know, you sure. probably can narrow that focus down a little bit on, you know, how do we make, you know, and as you well know out there, it's a, you know, if you shoot even in round one, good luck winning, right? I mean, it's it's low scores, lots of birdies. You're going to have to hit those short irons close to the pin. You're going to have to make four or five under a day, you know, yeah, to, right. to kind of get. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, you're probably yeah. practicing a little less of those mid irons and stuff like that for as well as you're driving it. I'm sure you have a lot of short irons in and chipping and puttons, you know. Getting around that chipping bar five and, and getting up, yeah, it's it's that's yeah, chipping and putting, yeah, chipping and putting, chipping and putting, right? That's that's the whole thing out there. If you if you just, you know, the rough isn't terrible. It's not like PGA Tour rough, but you just really have to make sure that you keep it between the trees and and to where you can just keep on advancing and keep moving it and try to avoid the chip outs and stuff like that, right? And if you and if you're in between stuff or something's crazy, hit a smart shot to the fat side, rely on your putter, and let's move on to the next one. You. Out on this tour, you've got to make, oh, you, you know, we call it the five under tour, right? So if you shoot five under par every day, you're you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna do great. It's not terribly difficult to shoot um, five under on on these golf courses. I I, I, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's not like trying to go shoot five under par on a seventy eight hundred yard golf course with with five inch rough. It's it's different. So. It's it's about managing yourself and it's about staying with the moment, taking advantage of of a few of the things and then not doing anything stupid. So if you if you if you miss a green, play a smart shot to ten feet, try to make the putt, um, rather than trying to hit the hero shot and avoid making doubles and triples and, and you know, it's it's a pretty simple formula really. I wish I would have had this perspective when I was on the tour. Um <laughs> Yeah, go yeah you're still learning, right? You're, you're 50 years old plus and still learning this great game. Isn't that crazy? That you think am, as long as you played learning. Harrison. Yeah, it may, it's amazing, right? Because you would think as long as you were on tour, you played over 400 events, college golf, all of it. Like you would have, like, I know what I'm doing. Um, you right. know, I talked to TA3 about this. Like Tommy said, he if his short game was as good as it was on the Champions Tour, he would have won more on the regular tour. And he was a great player in the regular tour. Like, his short game got better in his 50s. Like, it's such a great game that you can still get better as time goes on with this stuff. You have to find a new way to live or you die. I mean, and and on the PGA Tour, so much of it's about ball striking. And and the great ones spend a lot of time on their short game. But most of us who are trying to to really hone our long game, the short game work and the short game – you know, the importance of it kind of goes away. You think, you think you can just out strike and you can out, out hit a golf course and and you can't. Um, so you just have to find a new way. And, and so it, here's an interesting thing. So I was still this year at the U S open. I'd had a few decent weeks and Peter Jacobson grabbed me and pulled me aside and he goes, Hey, what are you doing? He goes, do you not, have you not figured it out yet that you don't have to play the way everybody else does? You don't have to do this. You're, you're good enough to do it the way you do it and, and, and compete and beat people do it the way you do it. Stop trying to do what everybody else is doing. Try, stop trying to do what everybody thinks you should do. Stop trying to do what everybody on TV says you should do. Stop that play, play the way you play off. Now I've heard that before and I've known it, but you kind of forget at times. And then I just needed somebody to kind of smack me upside the face with it. And, uh, <laughs> And you kind of go, oh, yeah, well, I guess I am. I don't have to force a driver in there. I can hit a hybrid off this tee and hit a bait iron to the middle of the green. I don't have to. I don't have to. So that, that's the perspective that I wish that I had 
you know, back yeah. back 25 years ago. Well, and somebody coming from, like, from Peter's perspective, too, right, he's, you know, such a well-respected player, and then he's been in the broadcast booth for so long, which gives him a different perspective probably of watching it, right? Like, you're... You're seeing yeah. this happening, you know. Is it, you know, how do you not take advice from him, right? Especially well, and he and he has a he, he and I've been close for a long time. He's got a, a little bit of a vested interest in what I what I do. My caddy is his brother-in-law, so, okay. um, and and we've had you know we've had a lot of talks and spent a lot of time together in, in the past. And he's always been you know a, a coach, and and you know I call him Uncle Peter, and and. Uh, because he's always the guy that would call and say, hey, you're doing great. Keep it up on this. See, you're going to win soon. This was the first time he'd ever really kind of grabbed me by the cheeks and said, hey, you need to hear me. And um, so, yeah, you know, sometimes it just takes that. We do get stubborn and, and we do get locked in. And, and sometimes we sometimes we miss the low hanging fruit. And uh, but, yeah, it, it means something when, when you get when you get somebody like that, it, that, that shows an interest in you can't help but listen. Yeah. Yeah, and I still think being in that broadcast booth, at least from the guys I've talked to who have done both, you know, professional playing in the booth, you get a different perspective of being in the booth. And like, oh, shit, if I would have known that, just you start watching those patterns, right? You know, you're you're watching yeah. the best players in the world, and you're like, oh, yeah, I used to do that, right? And I think there's a you, – you can't help, not help but learn uh, from that other position, I'd have to imagine. So the advice would be, be pretty sound coming from Peter, I'd have to imagine, at this point in his career. I mean, he's seen – He's seen everything. I agree. I agree. And, and I think it does matter, and it changes your perspective. So, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it's valuable. Biggest surprise from the Champions Tour. So you, you know, played the tour forever. You're getting ready to go out there. You get out there, and you're like, wow. Didn't, didn't think about that or didn't see that. Was there anything that stood out when you first kind of got out there competing? Oh, you know, I, I mean, people had told me, hey, be ready. These guys are better than you think. Um you know, they, they're, they're still working at it. And so I felt like I kind of knew, but I didn't really know how good the level of golf was. And, uh, I, I think these guys, yeah, they're, you know, maybe the swings look a little different and their bodies look a little different, but, but they're still really damn good at what they do. And, and they're working at it. It, it like, a, like we were saying earlier, it's important whether, whether you're a hall of famer or a guy trying to have a rebirth, it's still important. Winning, winning is important. Being prideful and, and being, being proud of, of the result that you put out there is important. So nobody wants to go out there and just, you know, you know, slap the ball around everywhere with no purpose and no intent and make an embarrassment of themselves. So, you know, it was, it was odd to see hall of famers on the driving range grinding for two, three, four hours and, and guys in there working on their equipment and grinding wedges and, you know, still looking for perfection in, in a game that perfection doesn't exist. So, um, and that, that was a little bit of a shock. I think, uh, on, on a positive side, the, the support and the, uh, the acceptance, I think, you know, it's a very close community kind of out there. There, there's guys that I've become very good friends with that I knew, uh, while I was playing, uh, on the PGA tour, but egos and, distance and agendas and all this other stuff wouldn't allow us to become friends. And now, you know, we're all kind of in the same, in the same boat, you know, everybody's been hurt or, you know, people have gone through divorces and their kids have gotten married or divorced, you know, everybody's got a yeah. story. And so they're, you know, they, they still might be jerks at times. So they might be sometimes a little obnoxious, but they're, they're more humbled. And uh, so it's been much more accepting than I was, than I was expecting. Uh, which has been good. Yeah, and, and I think just time, you know, time does that to people, right? Like, I hope I'm a better human being at 50 than I was at 40, and 40 I was at 30, right? You know, it, it's... Yeah, think, you would hope so, yeah. You'd hope, right? Like, you if get a little not, kinder. you're not, you point, yeah. Exactly, right? That you get a little bit of that. So I can see where, oh, you know, Monty might be a little bit calmer these days, right? And, and a little, a little less... Uh, you know, a little less Monty like, and and I kind of noticed like watching him. Like, you know, there was the period of time when people over here were not Monty fans. You go out to a Champions Tour event now, everybody loves Monty. You know, and it right, seems like yeah, he's chilled yeah. out a little bit for it, right? And it's kind of cool well, to see. Yeah, I mean, guys still have their moments, right? You can't a, tri a tiger can't change his stripes too much, but you know, guys like Miguel Angel Jimenez, we 
we had we we existed in similar orbits, but we never really had a reason to be friends. And and you know, we become friends this year. We go to dinner and we we practice together. And I just I love him to death. I mean, his his perspective on life and enjoying it, but yet his desire to compete is uh, is incredible. It's contagious. So, and then even guys like uh, like like Jose Maria Olathebel. You know, I was I was sitting there in Birmingham and I was struggling with this little pitch shot on the practice screen and he came walking by and we had played the the week before, I think. And, uh, and he came up and said, you know, Hey, what, tell me about the bounce on your wedge when you're trying to do this, you know, you've got too much and you've got to get the heel back down to where you can get that leading edge in and keep your hands here. It, that, that never would have happened 25, 30 years ago. Never. Um, but yet, but there's a little bit more of a communal, it's, it's much more civilized out there than, than it, than it is on the PGA tour. So, and stuff like that for a guy like me, that, that matters, you know, to, and it, and it makes you feel like you're a part of it. It makes you feel like they are, they are saying to you, Hey, you know, we, we see what you're doing. We're, we're, we're behind you. Um, and that makes you feel good. Whereas on the PGA tour, you've got your little small little group and everybody else is trying to, they're trying to kick you off the tour, you know, right. not, not trying to help you. So yeah. yeah. And the cool part, like a thing from Ollie, right? Like that's probably coming what he learned from Seve. Right, like you're getting that knowledge base passed down from one of the greatest. Exactly, like, that came game. from like, somewhere. How cool is that? Yeah, yeah exactly. From... And, and and he's a master himself. I mean, there's still very few people in the world who are as as good with a wedge as 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 Jose. I mean, so yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just it, it's you know who knows where it came from, and it's the same stuff they probably told Sergio, and and you know, and and so just being a part of it and kind of getting that same interaction is special. Yeah, I I, um, I don't know if you remember this. I was down at the Houston event. Tommy was playing in. I brought the family, got out of the cold, and I said hello to you in the the, the clubhouse there. Um, in in I watched Ali. I was at that event. And I watched him come in, and I'm such a fan of his. You know, he doesn't hit it real far off the tee, but his iron play is just still ridiculously good, and the sound of it and the ball flight. And I saw him in the. He was sitting at a table, you know, with with McGinley and all that. And I was like. I don't even know what to say to him. Like, right. It's just, it's, it's like, I could come up to you and say hello. You were there with your wife and you were great with your time. Like, I'm comfortable saying hello to you. I, I would, I don't like, I don't like, it's all a fable, right? Like, what, <laughs> what do you, like, I, I, you know, a huge fan. Like, I mean, what do you say to him? I was kind of like, yeah, I'm not even going to say hello. Like, and I watched him. If he had 20 more yards off the tee, 25, he'd be dangerous. But the sound of those irons still and the trajectory right. he hits those wedges on. Oh. That it's motion beautiful, is still, it? it's just, if I could hit a short iron in my mind, you know, if I could flight a nine iron like that sound and that trajectory and that heaviness, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know if anybody hits short irons any better. Like, it is just there, a there, piece of art watching it. Yeah, there's very few. And I would tell you that most of these guys now are to the point where I'm, I get it. They're superstars and things like that. There might be a language barrier every once in a while, but. 98% of them are, are probably much more approachable now than they ever were. And, you know, it, it would be perfectly fine to walk up and say, hello, you know, uh, and, and, and they would, they may not sit there and have a long conversation with you, but they're, they're not going to give you the brush off. Like, like maybe they would have back when they were in the heat of the moment. Um, well, well, next so, time I bump into him, I'll, I'll say hello. But at the time, I mean, such a hero, right? He was just, yeah such a hero of mine growing up it's just you know then the back then there was that nostalgia of coming across the pond and the Ryder cup stuff and winning the ma i mean it was ollie right like yeah. you know this yeah, mystic cool creature from across the pond that just came over here and whooped ass every now and then took his trophies home and then came back to the Ryder cup and you know killed you again <laughs> right there was just a flair to the way that man played golf and it exactly. was exactly yeah it was cool stuff so it was cool to watch him play the short irons are still there um yeah. Side note: I was going to ask you what what happened with Trinity Forest and not being uh, for the Nelson anymore. I loved watching that golf course when it was on TV. I, I I thought it was such a cool, I you know, break from the normal PGA Tour course. I love Core Crenshaw designs. Like, I was surprised that went away. I thought it was cool as hell. Like, it was just awesome looking. Well, uh, it, it it yeah, that was a that that was so that that was a labor of love for a, a bunch of us. Uh, in Dallas to try to bring something different and try to take a piece of 
property that had otherwise been abused and neglected and abandoned. It was a, a misused uh, landfill forever. It's out of the floodplain, but when when you built when when they hatched this idea uh, to build the golf course, you you had to take all the trees off of the top of the cap, right? So it then you, you say, okay, well, what are we going to do with this thing now? So now it needs to be the minimalist uh, kind of a linksy style. And I will just say this: there there are wonderful golf courses that make terrible professional golf venues and there's incredible venues that are not very good golf courses. This was, this was the latter. It was, or the first, it was a, it was a, it's a really good golf course. The members love it. Uh, it's a blast to play. It's unique. It's thoughtful. It's intentional. But when you have that small of a piece of property with so few avenues in, uh, you know, egress and uh, to get people in and out for what the salesmanship club wanted to do and what the Byron Nelson wanted to be, it just was not a match made in heaven. It, it's difficult to get 25, 30,000 people out there moving um, properly. So the event struggled. And then we had terrible weather uh, the first year. I think it was the hottest, uh, driest May on record. So it was dusty and, and everybody was dying of heat exhaustion because there's no shade so then the next year they came out spent a lot of money and and put air conditioning and shading everywhere and and then we had the coldest wettest may on record and and you started to realize that okay we need to have a more traditional venue that's got more places that we can get in and out we need concrete we need so i i think it was a a, it was a mutual parting of ways that the the damage to Trinity Forest during the construction process and during the tournament process was outweighing the benefits. And, uh, and clearly the salesmanship club needed, you know, uh, a place where they could put a lot of people. So uh, I don't think there was anything. um, uh, I don't know the right word. Nobody was, you know, it wasn't ill will. It was just, it wasn't working for either group. It was, uh, it, it was a wonderful idea. It was it was a great attempt. It just it just didn't work. Um, but Trinity Forest is doing great right now. It's got a bunch of members. I think there's actually a waiting list. Um, people love playing it, and uh, and they and they're they're using it and they're enjoying it, and that's what matters. Yeah, from day to day played. I don't know if anybody in the modern era does it any better than Mr. Core and Mr. Crenshaw. Like I love their designs. I, I think it's so thoughtful. It's so much fun. I think really yes. good players can enjoy it and 20 handicaps can go and play it, right? And it's, that's a tough thing to do architecturally to have both of those players enjoy that process. They're, they're just geniuses at, at making that happen, in my opinion. I think they are. I think they've, they've got such a respect for the history of the game. And, um, you know, their idols are people like Dr. McKenzie and, 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 and those guys. And they, they, they hold you know, the great courses around the world in such high esteem, they don't want to build something that's going to be green and be a garden. You know, they want it to, they want, they want golfers to have to hit something high, then hit something low. They want, it depends on the left. They want them to think and connect the dots that, okay, I need to hit it over here off the tee so that I can hit it there. You don't just stand up and just jump in your cart and, you know, not that there's anything wrong with it, but you know, golf isn't always meant to be in a cart with music playing, you know, drinking beer and, and, you know, just flying at the pin, right? There's, there's gotta be both. You gotta have the, uh, the walk and the strategic part of it as well. And I think they get it. I think they still do. I, I, I've seen, I've seen the best players come out there and play and get totally frustrated to death because they stand up and hit a good driver up there 70 yards from the green and they don't have a shot. Whereas, you know, if they would have laid it back to 120, they could have spun it, and it's a pretty easy birdie. And but they they just keep doing it, you know. And and so it makes you think, and it makes you better. Yeah, I love that style of golf, right? Kind of having to chess match it around. It's uh, yeah, their 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 stuff is so good. Um, yeah, it's fun. And for me, it was I just one little note. I mean, and I learned something when we were building it. I would go out there with Ben and Bill and and walk around and listen to them. They never showed me the pictures. They never showed me the drawings, but they would always ask me questions about, you know, what would you think about this? What would you think about 
you know, this. So, so I get a call one day and it was from Ben and he said, where are you? I said, well, I'm up at Preston trails, which is North of Dallas. And he said, would you come down here, please? We need some help. Bring your shag bag. I said, okay. So I, sh- you know, I drive 45 minutes and get down there with my shag bag. And he says, we want you to hit drivers in three woods off this tee. And, and, uh, Bill's out there. He's going to put a flag. Everyone you hit good. He's going to put a flag out there with the carry distance. And, um, so I finally just said, okay, what are you doing? You know, after about 40 balls. And he said, well, we're trying to get the exact yardage for this bunker placement because we want where we end up putting the green. We want a driver to be too much club and we want a three wood to barely not be enough to get over that bunker because, and I'll never forget what he said. He said a, a good short hole should not be about, can I get there? The question should be, should I? And that stayed with me forever. And I even still think about it now. I can get to that par five and two, but should I? Like I can drive it up close to that green, but should I? I, I still remember that conversation. And so it was a wonderful experience to hear their perspective and, and just how the game should be played. And what a cool experience to be able to kind of, for them to rely on you as sort of the, the tour eyes out there of how do you see this? What do you think? Like just to be involved with those guys, right? Like what an honor. How cool is yeah, that? Yeah, just, just to get a glimpse inside to see how the sausage is made is, is, yeah. was, was really special. And, uh, and, I, and I love that kind of stuff. I, I, when, when Trip Davis was doing Northwood, I would go out there. I'm sure he got to the point where he was ready for me to leave, but I would, I would sit there and ask him, okay, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why is this here? Why is this here? And uh, he was very patient, and just to watch them sit there and just slowly work it, you know, they're they're artists. These guys that that are building these golf courses are artists, and and I don't think they get enough credit for what they do. Yeah, and it comes off like it just was kind of naturally there, right? It just comes, you know, especially like a core crunch. It just comes off where it's like, well, you know, well, of course the bunker should be there, and it slopes this way. And you think about this way of how hard it is to make it look like it's simple, but it's not yes. simple, right? There's right. the art of of the thought process. But you never look at one of their courses and be like, well, that doesn't make any sense. It, it makes complete <laughs> sense. And that's, but it looks, but their courses look when they're done, you know, simple, but they're right. complex. That's the yes, beauty of it. I, I love their yes, stuff. Yes, they are. That's well said. Well, I was going to ask you too, uh, you know, news in golf, the, uh, the golf ball potential rollback. Oh man, that's a shit storm Ooh. going in Twitter land. Um, Yes, it is. Uh, I would love your opinion on on that one. And, you know, you sort of played in that generation of, you know, you're probably hitting it farther at 45 than you were at 28, even though you were long at 28, right? So you've seen the changes Ooh. and all that equipment stuff happen. What, you know, good, bad, or ugly, what's your take on it? Oh, wow. That's a um, – so – I, the, yes, I'm longer now at 52 than I was at 28, um, with five miles an hour less swing speed. And so you have to ask, why is that? You know, uh, I, the, the, the chicken of the egg, right? Is it the lighter composite materials with the shafts? Is it the heads? Is it the, or is it the golf ball? Or is it everything together? We have to realize that there's really, really smart people that are, that are working. I mean, there's, 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 rocket scientists literally that, that work for these golf equipment companies and they work within the parameters that they're given and they, their job is to maximize the equipment to make it do more. And once they did that, then the teaching went that way. I, I feel like the USGA missed the boat and should have addressed the driver maybe 10, 12 years ago, even when, um, you know, when they went to the bigger heads and the titanium and they started introducing all of these spring-like faces and all this stuff, that's when they should have said, hey, 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 okay, wait, let's go back in size. Um, but they didn't. So now the, the it's hard to put the BBs back in the box. But the, the, the golf ball now, I'm not so sure how much – I don't understand it. I'm not smart enough to know. But I feel like this is going to be a kind of a, a minimal – change and like i said these smart people are just going to figure out how to work it again and they're going to make a slower golf ball now go further um whether they do it by cover or core or you know or, or, or dimple patterns or whatever they're, they're going to figure it out again so 
I think I would be in favor of letting just the public do what they do, play with what they play, and who cares if an eight handicapper hits it a little further. Um, but I would be in favor of bifurcating the rules and, and having professional golfers having to play a restricted size of the driver and maybe play a more standardized ball if, if we're going to go that way. Um, I just don't know. I, I'm not seeing how this is going to solve any problems um, with what they've proposed right now. So, you know, we'll yeah, and if, if, yeah, and me, you know, owning a golf club company, it's, it's, you know, we don't want the average 10 handicap, you know, if, and who knows where the ball will turn out, but if it's, you know, Rumorville that has it, if it's five to seven yards with someone swinging a driver at 90 miles an hour, that's not good for, you know, Bob Smith, you know, playing 6,200 yards already of just an enjoyment factor, you know, sure. we, we, I, I don't want him going from 218 yards off the tee back down to 200. He's not going to be a happy camper, uh, you know, or, right. you know, losing 10 yards off the tee. Does that put a bad taste in people's mouths? They don't play as much. That's my concern, right? Of it was right. sort of like the anchoring rollback. Like Jesus, if the the guy's got the shakes over four footers, <laughs> he's an amateur, and he can, you know, he's shooting eighty three. Eh, let him belly it, right? I'm guessing that's why the PG of America was against that rule when it happened, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. So I, it's, it's well, I think that was so. The I was in the room when they made the proposal for the for the the ban of the belly and the anchoring stuff. And that, no matter how you sliced it, that just felt like they were doing it because it was it was because of optics. They didn't like the way it looked, and and they were going to find all the justifications that they needed to try to ban something that they didn't like the way it looked. This to me feels a little different, but I you're, I agree with you. I don't want the average golfer to, to to struggle anymore. I want them to be better. I want them to enjoy it. I want them to go. I want them to feel like they can go buy a driver and have it custom fit and it's going to make them better. Uh, You know, we need that golf is on the upswing. Let's not, let's not throw a wrench in that right now. So go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted. Yeah, no, I agree. Right. Because you play with amateurs all the time. Like no one is, you know, our home golf course is par 70 golden age era, small greens, you know, 6,300 yards from the blue tees. I play the white tees at, 6,100 yards. It feels like a 6,500 yard golf course. No one's out there shooting 64 or 63 on the weekends. A great round is 68 still. Right. right? And the course built 19. So for 99.99% of the people, this is not affecting anything. Uh, I always thought, but then like if, you, if they do the bifurcation of the driver and ball, then the manufacturers are kind of, you know, the, the players would get less money because, you know, um, you know, like when you were with Srixon, right? And all of a sudden now, if you're playing a driver that not, I'm not going to buy, hypothetically, when you were, you know, on staff with them, how do I market yeah. Harrison Frazier and I are playing the same driver, but we don't, right? So there's money out of your pocket for the players. Mm. So that's yeah. tough, right? So that's true. That's I a good thought, point. I didn't think about that part. Yeah. yeah. How do you, mar- how do you, you know, then if, if the PGA Tour, it's, it's, you know, assuming they look at the well being of the players, well, that's not good. Right, because if I'm like I said, if I'm Titleist, how do I how do I thread this? I always thought the easiest solution would be if you're talking about the Open, the the the, the Masters, and the U.S. Open, just give you guys two balls to go play with. If you want to play in the Masters, here's the balls. You know, there's slight difference between the two. It's ten percent less. Hit whatever driver Ooh. you want, and that's it. Right, and then Titleist isn't behind the eight ball of being stuck, you know, then the rest of the time, the PJ tour, if you're on live or champ, you're playing whatever you want to play, right? We're, we're going to let the, so you guys can have logos on the bag and I can play the same driver you do. But just for that one week, it's an RNA ball. W- would that solve it? Would that be enough where you can play oh. Marion again in the old course and it doesn't hurt? But then the flip side of that is how long does it take for you to get comfortable with an equipment and ball? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think right now, Titleist offers for professional players, there are 17 different SKU balls, so the versions of the Pro V1 that guys can use, different firmnesses, different launch angles, different spins. Um, so guys are very, very, very in tune with their particular ball. And I think you'd run into issues if the Masters were to say, hey, now you have to use this ball I don't know if that opens them up to 
to lawsuits or anything like that. I think Wimbledon used to do that, right, with with tennis balls, and and they've even gone away from that, haven't they? Uh, I, well, I, yeah, I think some of the I know te- I'm not a huge tennis guy, but I know like they use different balls for different court conditions, right? So they slow a U.S. Open ball down so it's not okay. just you know smash the serve and no one can return it. I I did not know that. So yeah. I, they, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's very complicated. But then, who, who's responsible for manufacturing that ball and for developing it? Is that uh, Augusta? You know, does, does, right? does Augusta go to go to one manufacturer and say, "Here, you're going to, if you want to make a Masters um, um, accredited ball, this is what it has to do, and this is how it has to be designed, and you can do it and give it to your players." Uh, but they can't. They're going to use a Titleist Pro V1 Masters ball. They can't use the regular, whatever Titleist Pro V1 Left Dash Star, whatever. They, it's just one more. Uh, is that how? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, kind of yeah the right. They, exactly. The they Here's change the pr- it to, they, yes. they can operate Here's- within their same manufacturing process, but change. Uh, the, the characteristics of, it, of the cover, the dimple, whatever. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So it goes 10% less, for, not 5%, right? Like you really want it to play good at 7,100 yards. It's, you know, 330, 325 becomes 290, 275, 280. Right. Like enough to make it significant. But yes, then you would have to have Bridgestone or Titleist or Strixon have the parameters so they could make the ball for that one week. I don't know who pays for it. Here's a problem. But, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to – I don't even know if this is the right answer. I'm just trying to think, like, how do you work through this? Because every scenario, somebody's kind of getting hurt here. Right. You know, right. There's, there's no, like – there's no uh, innocent bystander in this argument. No. No, but uh, – now, so you would know this better than I do. Don't most of the companies, the standard on the drivers for – is it 460 is the max – size mm-hmm. you can do right so yeah and you got a little most, bit of wiggle room over that like it can be like 462 little, okay but most companies produce uh, smaller driver heads don't they along that i mean they have like a, a, a 400 and a 420 and a 440 i think callaway does i think TaylorMade, you know has a small driver i wonder if you know if they were just to say hey you know we're going to say you got to use a 400 cc driver head and and maybe they limit the length of the shaft. And uh, and if somebody wants to try to swing a a, a a 300 a mini driver, a tailor-made mini driver at 120 miles an hour, you know, good luck. You know, try that. And and let's see if you can stay on the golf course. But um, I don't know. There's got to be a better way that doesn't affect the masses, uh, and but but still get the desired result that they want. And and interestingly, I heard a, a uh, somebody say today that the USGA has already said that by doing this, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to bring back a lot of the old, great traditional golf courses. They're already, they're just too short no matter what. So uh, if, if we're not going to be able to play Marion or cricket club or something else like that, then, then, then why are we, that, that's exactly. the like, reason does, to not do it. Well, right, because five percent, I don't think is enough, Harrison. I, I think you got to, if you want to play Marion for you guys, it's got to be like a ten percent reduction of like distance, right? Okay. So what's Marion? Sixty-eight, six. I mean, it's yeah, it's, you know, seventy-five, seventy-four. Now it goes out to sixty-eight, sixty-nine. Like it's got to be in there. I don't right. think five percent is enough. If you're going to do this, you then it's, that's almost like I'm in favor of like a bifurcation of it. Like I don't see with enough time. The athlete's getting stronger. If it's 5%, is it still, you know, and fast forward seven years, six years, five years, whatever it is, is 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 that 5% reduced now the same as where they're hitting it now five or six years later? As the equipment still gets a little bit better and we squeeze out another mile an hour to a ball <laughs> speed, right? So it's yeah. not enough. I, and to answer your question on the driver, I could make a 400cc driver still spring at maximum with the technology that's out there. No problem. Like our pro driver is 450cc. It's a little bit smaller. You'd have to go down to like a 350cc and almost have the spring effect of like, you know, remember the old like 915, 918 drivers, you know, from 2003, 4, something yeah. like that. That would probably do it. And that size, you know? that's almost like a three wood now, isn't it? I mean, yeah, three that... woods. 
at the two oh, two ten two fifty. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they're quite a bit smaller. So, but if you had, you know three forty three fifty cc and it didn't have as much jump in the face, which you know you could make everyone could make one of those easily because just old tech, right? Just you retard how much the face moves and you'd make it smaller. That would do it. You know, if, yeah. if, if, if we gave you a, a ball from 03 and, uh, you know, a, a 2002 or 2003 Titleist driver, you'd be 20 yards shorter. No question. No, no maybe, maybe more. Maybe more. more. Right. That would do it. But then once again, now we're back to the problem of what's, you know, how does Titleist market that for majors? It's, you know, well, you can't play right. Justin Thomas's driver this week. He's playing, go get one from 2002. You'd probably have to take that much Ooh. off. To, to, to go yeah. back and play Philly cricket, right, or Chicago Golf Club, and yeah, make it work. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a such I don't an know. interesting debate. It's a debate. complicated thing. I, I, it, it really is. And I, I know that the USGA is trying, but they uh, – I don't know if this is a whiff. Time will tell. And uh, it, just, I'm, I, it just seems to me so complicated with how they're doing it. I just wish that they would simplify the whole thing. But uh, I don't see – I don't see the benefit. And tight was it Tiger who said this week bifurcation. He's in favor of bifurcation because uh, just like look at baseball, right? You know, the, right. You, if you're going to play in majors, you're going to use a wooden bat. Yep. And so, but bat companies still market it. You know, they still sell bats. The the wooden bat companies make aluminum. There's, you know, they they figure it out. I don't know. I don't know if baseball players are getting endorsement deals for bat companies, are they? But that one I don't know, right? Then yeah, the question is, right? Do you, do you, yeah, does you know Nike might give them a contract for just being a Nike athlete, but are you just get free baseball bats if you're playing Louisville Slugger because no one's going to buy these damn things, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. For your mere mortals or playing college or everybody else, right? Sure. And they just have sort of, for lack of a better word, the pro game is so much different than anybody else's bat. They sort of let it go, and we'll sell a bunch of carbon fiber and aluminum bats to 99.9% of the other people. Which, yeah. you know what, in time, I agree with you. In time, it would, it would work itself out because it would have to. Yeah. Right? Like eventually, everyone would know eventually it would. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every, you know, every major manufacturer makes a great driver, and they know that you know whatever brand these guys play, because I would argue everybody makes really great equipment these days, Um. They just realize the pro has a version of that driver, and we have a version, and they're just different. Right. You know, you could still use the same irons and the same ball and all that stuff. I would, have, you know, I don't, I don't think they're talking. Of, you know, like, unless irons, you know, does it really matter if somebody's hitting a seven iron or an eight iron? I don't know. I think it's probably more the driver distance more than anything else. Of if you can knock thirty yards off that, then you know you probably don't need to work with the ball as much. Right. Well, so when when Hogan when Hogan won the U.S. Open at Marion, we were talking about that, and and he hit was it on eighteen or seventeen the famous shot that he's got the one iron or the two iron into that green. How the one iron, the one iron. Think about how far back you'd have to make that hole now to make it where guys had to hit you know driver and a and a well whatever comparable one iron would be three iron uh, three iron right yeah. probably loft wise. I mean, you, 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 they're, they're hitting three irons. 240 or 250 yards in the air right now, and they're hitting a driver 335, 340. You'd have to make the hole almost six. Well, what is that? That would be almost 600 yards. Yeah. To make yeah, that. I think happen. Mr. Hogan hit a one iron like 200 yards. I think if you looked at his old yardages, which is a three iron today with the old ball from the 50s, right? That was like a 200 yard shot. Gotcha. Yeah, I yeah, mean, right. If, I mean, they're, we're, we're, it's huge if, if we're if we're trying to get back to that ideal, it's never going to happen, right? So let, let's find another way, and, and let's not hang in, hang on to trying to restore all the same shot values for all these old courses. But let's also not let them become obsolete. And I, I, and I agree with the USGA's charge of trying to remedy that, but I just like like you said, I just don't know if this is going to be enough. And um, I hope they figure it out. Well, the other big one out there, it's uh, the deadline's coming, the, the the live PGA Tour merger. Are you hearing anything? Is, you know, is it uh, – God, where does this – where Jesus, where this – we could talk an hour on this one. Where Do, do you have a quick <laughs> synopsis from your business mind of where you think this may go? Gosh. Well, it feels to me like – 
where it's been trying to go, but the PJ Tour is holding it back. They're try- it just it just feels to me like this is designate. It's going to ultimately be three uh, different levels of tour. They're going to add a different level and they're going to have to have some movement a fair movement in between the two, similar to what soccer does in Europe. Um, yeah. But, you know, especially if they do the deal with PIF and uh, live gets incorporated in the guys all get to come back. I think it's interesting that Rom, uh, his, his timing uh, right now to, to take a guy who's always said he would never do it. He must have some information knowing that all sins are going to be forgiven because I think he does value majors and, and legacy. So he must, they, they might, they might be close, but you know, ultimately they're going to have to bring this thing in and they're going to have to bring all these guys back in and they're going to have to promise them, you know, a bunch of money in the form of purses and, and they're going to have to have a PGA tour, a, a PGA tour B and then a, uh, uh, corn fairy, you know, and, and instead of trying to have it all be one tour where there's all this overlap, it just seems like it's too complicated. They're trying to make too many people happy. Um, and, and as a result, I feel like they're not making anybody happy. Um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of people that, that are speculating. Um, I clearly don't know. I think well, you're right. I think it turns into, there's a huge event in Singapore and a huge event in Riyadh and a huge event in Sydney. And it turns into kind of like Norman's idea in the nineties where it turns into just essentially there's, you know, if it's teams or whatever it is, 75, 80 guys, no cut. And it brings every, you, everybody can relegate up or down to that. It's maybe what 12, 13 events, which is huge purses that would try to get somewhat of a world audience. Right, where the world would stop and from everywhere because there's now guys from the Japanese tour who could relegate up into there, right? You'd have to be able to then grab those guys from all those tours and let them work their way up so they could get there to get the fan base, I think. I don't know. I know they're, they're you know, the, the team idea, I, you know, it, I can I can sort of see it and sort of I still struggle to see it, but I'm also a 50-year-old guy who's watched individual golf my whole life, right? So, yeah. It, you know, maybe the younger generation it works, but that's, I, I agree with you. I think that's how this thing eventually spins out. Right. It just and feels he, like that's where it needs to go. And, and there's no question the golf needs to maybe look at different formats. Maybe the four day, you know, starting on Thursday, ending on Sunday, maybe that is getting old. Maybe they do need to, to change it up some, uh, I, but I, I don't know about the team thing either. I'm same demographic as you. I, I've, I've, I've seen and I've watched golf and participated forever and it's supposed to be a certain way. And I loved my time at team golf when I, when I played at college, I mean, I loved it, but I don't know if that's got any real, real teeth in, in, in pulling people in around the world. I just don't, I just don't know it. Um, but I, I could see a system of uh, a team of individuals that are all playing, you know, kind of like they're doing, uh, where you have shared marketing, you have shared expenses, you have, yeah. uh, you know, AT and T, for example, might come in and pay a team a hundred million dollars to have four guys that are that are going to all be out there carrying the AT and T bag and wearing the hat. But I don't know if I need to see a, a highest score thrown out shotgun format. In short, it just feels like it might be a bridge too far for for most most golf fans. Um, but I, I'm in favor of some change. I think it does need to get. You know, uh, shaken up just a little bit. I, I went to the live event in Chicago this year. It, it was fun. Like it's fun. Like from my, you know, my wife's, you know, doesn't really golf, but you know, and she had a blast and we went to the concert afterwards and you get to see, you know, the good part about the shotgun start is you get to see it's over in three and a half, four hours and you get to see them all come through. Like I can see for like, you, you know, I'm such a golf nerd you know, I had to kind of look at it from a different perspective. I had a blast being there. We were at a party hole and stuff, but like watching the people around it, they had fun. There's music yeah. going, beers are flowing. The food was great. Like it was fun. And the concert right yeah. afterwards, like the vibe kept going. Like we had like, you know, for my wife to go out to an event and, and it really is like, that was such a fun day. Like that, I think that's where they're trying to get to a little bit, right. Of that sure. thing to come out and just have themselves a day. And it was fun. Well, I mean, isn't the uh, every every tournament in the world wants what the waste management has in Phoenix, right? They want it to exactly. be a party and a social event, and a place to be, a bucket list 
type thing that just so happens to have a golf tournament going on in the middle of it. And so if they can create that, I'm all for it. If it brings people there and like my son did summer school with a big group of his buddies in London and half of them one day just jumped on the train and they went and they went to the, to the live event and they had an absolute blast. They, they loved it. They said it was so much fun and, and, and the people were great and it just felt so energized. Um, you know, the, and they, a lot of them described it as kind of like a, like a Phoenix feel, um, which I think it's healthy. You don't you now as a player, you don't want to play in that every week. It's a circus, but for the fans and for growing the game and getting people there, bringing money, bringing eyeballs, that's, that's what you want. So uh, I'm glad that y'all went. I'm glad you had fun. I, I've yet to go. I've yet to, to see one. I'm, I'm not opposed to it. I, I'd probably be a guy that would walk out there and put a hat and glasses on and, and, and go partake just like everybody else. Yeah, it was, it was a really fun day. Like genius having like Phoenix, they have the big concert right afterwards, right? So golf's over, boom, lights go down, yeah. concert starts and everyone was saying like, it was, it was a, we had a great time. So there's elements I think they're just going to be all brought to it too. Then, you know, another rabbit hole is, well, what, what do you do with the European tour and the corn fairy tour? Does that have to merge now? So you don't have four, you know, who's in front of who there, oh, you, you know, uh, you, you know, I, I don't know if you need four tours, right? If there's this world tour, PGA tour, was a DP world tour then, then corn fairy? Like, I, you know, yeah, I don't the, know. You know. I, I don't know. There, there's so many things that are here. They just got to get this deal done. I, I struggle more. I, I don't struggle too much. I think they can figure out the competition side. Uh, the structure of how the PJ tour is set up with the nonprofit and the profit. And then how do you give equity to the players out of the profit piece? And, you know, hypothetically take a Jordan or a Justin and they're going to get a certain number of shares. Well, they're, they're, they're never going to retire. How do how do you create more shares for the new people that are coming in? Like, I just don't understand what they're talking about. I, I, I don't understand how you can create something like that and give it, give players ownership. And if you start leaving people out, you know, then now all of a sudden, now you're going to have guys that are going to start looking for other alternatives again. They're not going to sit around and take it. So in essence, golf is a meritocracy. You have to go play for your play for your food. So put 25, 30 million bucks in the purse and let the guys go, go, go bang their heads for it. Right. Let's, let's not, let's not try to rewrite all of it. Um, let's, let's let it still have its integrity. Well, ho- hopefully that's why somebody like Jimmy Dunn is on that committee to kind of figure out a fair way to do it. get the smartest guys in the world and say, okay, how do we make this work? Right. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know about the guys that are on it anymore. They've got, clearly they've got a governance issue and uh, I don't know how, what's going to come of that. They formed that new committee that they're taking a look and a review at everybody and everything. Boy, it just seems like a whole lot. Um, to mess with right now well well it gives us something to talk about especially in the off season <laughs> here yeah i got two more quick ones here for you yeah, two or really, three yep. best golf courses don't be tour course but just two or three best golf courses you've ever played architecturally that you just wouldn't experience anywhere around gosh the world. well you mentioned one just a second ago chicago golf club it's pretty good. um i i absolutely love it uh, i got a chance to play it now four years ago or so and my gosh, the uniqueness and the quality and the feel and the tradition and the experience and the grass. And I mean, all and of greens. it was the in greens. greens and the shapes and the slopes and the punch bowl and the, I mean, all the stuff that's there and the sight lines. It's just genius. It is, it is absolute, uh, it, it's pure genius. Um, my favorite golf course that if I had one round of golf left to play would be Cypress Point. And that's, that's that's despite the 18th hole, believe it or not. I mean, I could play the 17 and, and then go back to any other hole on the golf course to finish as my 18th. Maybe not one. Take away one and seven. Take take away one and 18. But still, those other 16 are as good as you're ever going to find in the world. Um, I, I did I did look for the traffic to make sure on one. I did not accidentally. I was so nervous on the first tee. I was going <laughs> to skimmy one over the shrubs and do a, an Audi or something, right? That was a weird tee shot, like. All right, here it is. It, it's um, a it's a it's a crazy experience, isn't it? You're sitting on that little bitty putting green, waiting to get your chance 
uh, you know, to go hit it. And, and if nobody's going before you, you really don't know where you're going. You're kind of wondering, yeah. what am I doing here? Um, I mean, that tee box isn't any bigger than a king size bed. Uh, right back then, that putting green is like a dining room rug. And, yeah. uh, and he's just, but it is just absolutely amazing. And it's withheld, stood up over time, relatively unchanged. And it's just so dramatic and it's so cerebral and physically demanding and mentally demanding. I just think it's wonderful. It's such a cool variety of holes too that are just naturally there. Exactly. You know, exactly. It, you know, it's a masterpiece. Uh, it's a, that, I, that's a good one. That's, that's definitely a good one. Uh, last one I got for you. The, the most of all the guys you played with on tour, it's actually kind of a two part question. The person with the most just raw, natural, God given talent, we were just blown away how good they are at golf. And then secondly, is there a player that comes to mind that's just underappreciated in kind of the golf world of how good that player truly was? Like may not have all the physical gifts in the world, but damn if that person didn't get every ounce out of their abilities and just could get the ball in the hole. And, you know, they just kind of fly under the radar a little. Oh, well, I think the talent question is a layup. Uh, you know, you, you Tiger and Phil, a golf IQ – physical ability, imagination, the ability to actually see what their mind or do what their mind sees, uh, was just absolutely, uh, you know, elite. I mean, absolute elite and not, a, and, and the results showed it, right. They, they had the, they had the mindset and the, and the determination to match up with their talent. But, uh, I mean, you gotta, you gotta put Phil up there. Uh, and, Despite all the all of the live stuff, Tiger and Phil, and in, in, in my everybody I've seen, we're talking about people I've seen. Yeah, yep, people you've seen. Um, so now, I mean, under underappreciated or undervalued, I think people have forgotten about Justin Leonard uh, and and just how. And of course, he's one of my one of my best friends. You know, but he he was uh, one of the most determined and the hardest working, and one of the most intelligent and got the most out of it of anybody that I knew in my generation. Uh, he, he, he won, I forget 14 times in a major yeah, and a players and hall of famer in my opinion. I think he should be in the hall of fame. Yes. But, uh, you know, but he, but he did all of it. He spent 10 years, I think inside the top 10 in the world, you know, but he started so early. He was only 22 or 23. I think when he, maybe 24, when he got there, when he got into the top 10 and, you know, he was out of the top 10 by the time he was 32 or 33, something like that. And that's a lot of time has passed. I think, I think people in this, in that are, that are new to the game or, or the new generation of fans, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't look at him playing golf and think that that guy was a world beater. Um, but he, he maximized everything to his potential, his mindset, his game, his work ethic, the way he saw it, the way he acted towards it. I mean, everything. So he, he, he would have to be up there at the top. I think if you go one generation above, uh, you got to look at Corey Pavin as somebody that just got absolutely the most out of it that, that you possibly could. So those would yeah. be my two. Those would be my two. I, I, good choices on both of those, right? I mean, Corey Pavin and hitting it 250 yards off the tee and just carving – fairway woods in puts it great like yeah i mean well, he what was a, in a interesting way of getting it too. done yeah, yeah, yeah mentally tough absolutely right mentally tough i mean he would he would look at the biggest hitters and the biggest guys out there and say i don't care i'm gonna beat you like this and 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 still today the shots that he hits around the greens and the went out of bunkers and the wedge shots and stuff are just things that i never would have even considered uh, and, and he can pull them off. So I just think guys like that, it's a superpower what they can do. And, and it goes underappreciated in today's world of, you know, big brawny, hard hitters, tough talkers, you know, that, that whole thing, guys that are, you know, just little, little guys that worked hard and, and, and they, they beat you with their mind and their work ethic. That's, that's what I think of. Good choices. Harrison, thank you so much for this. I so enjoyed the conversation. Good luck with, you know, we'll be watching and 
2024 and uh, enjoy the off season. But congratulations on you know everything you've accomplished and and uh, it's been fun to watch your ascension you know on the Champions Tour again. Maybe 2024 senior major would sound pretty good. So yeah, that would be, that would be good. And uh, hopefully we can do it again and uh, celebrate another win. All right. Sounds great. Thanks so yeah, much. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it.